There was a report in a newspaper recently about a mother whose six-year-old had asked her whether he should put bread in the toaster, landscape, or portrait. <laughs> I mentioned this to my 10-year-old son, and he said he should have Googled it. <laughs> so why am I here, and why, I think, more interesting, why are you lot here? I mean, you could have watched this on uh, YouTube. Um, I think the answer to the first question is, is, is fairly simple. I'm trying to get people to read my new book, and I'm not on Facebook or Twitter. As to why you're all here, um, I'd like to explore that right at the end. Now, what's the book about? Why did I write it? Um, it's about our relationship with, with technology, specifically digital technology and screen culture. It's about how 4 billion mobile phones, 2 billion PCs, 500 million Facebook accounts, and probably a Google zillion internet searches, texts, and tweets could, if we're not careful, lead to the death of deep thinking. At least that's what the book ended up being about. The reason I wrote the book is that I had an idea. Um, an idea that occurred to me, actually, when I was slowly sipping coffee, staring into space on the rooftop of a hotel in Sydney, overlooking the harbor. But then I thought to myself, would I be having this thought if I was on the phone staring at a computer screen in a basement in London? I thought then, and I still think now, that the answer to that is no. Modern life is changing how we think, but perhaps the, the clarity to see this only comes with a certain distance or detachment. The overview effect is the state of heightened consciousness that astronauts experience when they look back at the Earth from a long way away. It's what William Anders, Frank Borman, and James Lovell, the crew of Apollo 8, experienced on Christmas Eve, 1968, when they saw something that nobody had ever seen before. If I could have the, night, the next slide, please. It's an Earth rise. A fragile blue planet rising optimistically above an inhospitable lunar landscape. Now, recognizing this was significant, Anders grabbed a camera and he took some photographs. And these photographs effectively started the environmental movement back on Earth in the 1970s. Interestingly, though, that's not what he saw. Everyone sort of tends to think that that's the image. It's actually the wrong way around. It's not landscape, it's portrait. And the moon is actually, or the Earth, sorry, is actually on one side. Now, this story proves to me, at least, that external stimuli do influence our thinking. You know, attitudes and behaviors that we sometimes think are fixed are constantly being influenced by objects and environments that are around us. Now, my original idea was to write a book about physical spaces, like this one, um, and how they influence thinking, a book about architecture and office design, essentially. But then my publisher pointed out to me that a book would probably sell about three copies. So I broadened the remit to include virtual spaces, digital devices, and eventually screen culture. Thus, it became a book about the future of thinking with a set of sociological and technological trends as the unifying force. Ultimately, though, I think it's about something slightly different. It's about our addiction to digital technology and the way this is changing our relationships with each other. Now, the book is split into three parts. The first part is about how attitudes and behaviors are changing. It looks at teens, preteens, and considers, amongst other things, connectivity addiction, whether or not multitasking is a myth, risk-averse parenting, electronic games, the fate of physical books, and whether or not IQ tests might actually be making kids rather stupid. The second part of the book is why, in my opinion, some of this stuff matters. This is about how our minds are different to machines currently, considers where ideas come from, which I'm very interested in, and contains a bit of a rant about paperless offices and a gentle plea for organized chaos in parts of our lives. The third and final section is then about how we as individuals and institutions well, what we as individuals and students can actually do about a world that's choked full of too much information, that's got too much distraction, and offers a few practical suggestions. Now, let's go through the three little bits. Um, this is actually quite an old photograph, so you can see a Rolodex there, which you wouldn't get anymore. Um, we are constantly connected nowadays. About 25, 30 years ago, half the world had never made a phone call. About 10 years ago, there were fewer than 500 million mobile phone subscribers worldwide. There are now 4.6 billion mobile phone subscribers. In the UK, 50% of children aged between five and nine now own a mobile phone. Now, I think one consequence of all this connectivity is that we're continually distracted. 
As a result, we never really get a chance to be by ourselves. We never really get a chance to know ourselves. We don't sit quietly anymore. We never get the opportunity to actually think deeply about who we are and where we're going. Ironically, this connectivity also means that we tend to be alone even when we're together. Now, you can see this, and I've seen this, when I go to restaurants and I see couples having, you know, anniversary dinners or something, and both of them spend the entire time texting. I've seen this with play dates with small kids, where a couple of kids come around, and two or three kids spend several hours on different digital devices without communicating with each other whatsoever. And this is what I call digital isolation. Now, what worries me most, though, is how this might be affecting the quality of our thinking. I think our thinking is in danger of becoming shallow, narrow, cursory, hurried, fractured, and thin. Now, I think this is problematic because originality, in my view, depends largely on thinking that's deep. Serious creativity, whether it's in business, science, the arts, I think is largely dependent on thinking that is calm, concentrated, focused, attentive, and above all, reflective. Another implication of constant connectivity and dis distraction is that it can lead to mistakes. And I think sometimes this can be absolutely fatal. This is what I call constant partial stupidity, and I am not immune. I suffer from this quite badly. We tend not to fully concentrate nowadays. Instead, we're constantly skinning the, scanning the digital environment, trying to look for new information. And we start to think that we can actually do more than one thing at once, but we end up getting distracted again and forget about what it is we're supposed to be doing. Uh, there's a US study from last year, and it says, not unsurprisingly, that multitasking is becoming the normal state. However, the same study has found, quite interestingly, that people that think they're the best at it are actually the worst. Heavy multitaskers are poor at analysis, they're quite bad at forward planning, and they seem to lose the ability to ignore irrelevant data. They're suckers for distraction. They become bored when they're not constantly, instantly stimulated. Now, it's quite true that you can turn this technology off, but most of us don't. There is cultural pressure, increasing cultural pressure, to be continually available and to respond instantly. I mean, I know of a 13-year-old girl that's on Facebook. She'd rather not be on Facebook, but the peer pressure to remain there is absolutely immense. As for mistakes, I think these can be pretty serious. You probably don't remember a Mr. De Silva. He was a sort of Portuguese man that famously used his laptop a little while ago to get instructions on how to avoid a traffic jam on the M6. Problem was, he was driving a lorry at the time. He smashed into a line of cars and killed six people. Now, I don't think he's alone in outsourcing his thinking to a machine. I mean, if you can Google any piece of information more or less instantly, why would you bother learning anything? If a sat-nav can tell you where you are all the time, why worry about situational awareness? Why bother learning to read a map? I think 20 years ago, Mr. De Silva would have probably planned ahead. He would have had a sort of rough plot of his journey. He would have known roughly where he was due to an elementary knowledge of geography. Nowadays, we just seem to make everything up on the run, and we delegate geography to a blind trust in technology. It seems to me that we need context as well as text. We need to understand principles before we move on to applications. We need breadth and depth, not just superficial facts. Unless we know how things relate to one another, we'll just have information. For knowledge, we need to understand connections. And for wisdom, we need to understand consequences. Second, if everyone is using the same sources, what of originality? Now, you probably think I'm exaggerating about this point, but I'm seriously not. Far from creating an intellectual paradise, there is a danger that di digitalization is narrowing our thinking. For example, 99% of Google searches do not proceed beyond page one of results. Academic papers are starting to cite fewer studies, not more. The other thing I'm sort of thinking about quite a bit is, is what if one day this stuff doesn't work? What then? We assume, for instance, that the internet will always work. What if it doesn't? What if one day the volume of data becomes so great that it becomes blocked? What if energy shortages disrupt access? What if cyber attacks become such a problem that things of great importance are moved offline? What then? How many individuals or institutions have a plan in case this happens? Have a plan in case mobiles, emails, sat-nav, Google, or the entire internet becomes unusable for a while? Can I get another slide, please? Um, why does any of this matter? Part two. Who cares if our brains are changing? They've always changed. We've always invented new things. We've always worried about new things. And I think to some extent, we've always moaned about the younger generations. Surely most of what I'm saying right now is conjecture mashed up with middle-aged technology angst. I think 
the answer to this is that things are a little bit different this time. These things are becoming ubiquitous. They're becoming addictive. They're becoming prescribed. At the moment, we do actually have a choice. We can choose paper over pixels. We can choose to talk to a human being rather than a customer service avatar. But what if one day there is no choice? What if all books became e-books? What if all doctors and teachers replaced by screens and machines? Perhaps then we would start to see technology as an instructor. And I don't think that's very far away from viewing technology as master. It probably sounds a bit fanciful, fanciful, but it's happening already. Governments and businesses alike across the world are moving everything they can online for the sake of cost or convenience. But I'm concerned that while the quality of communications is increasing exponentially, the quality of our communications might be going backwards. This is damaging for our thinking, but it's also damaging for our relationships. I mean, ideas, in my experience, are inherently social. They need physical interactions if they're to flourish. Secondly, and most importantly, I think people need people too. It seems to me that one of the byproducts of the digital age is that our relationships are becoming more superficial. Thanks to text messages, e-greetings, social networks, we know a lot more people, but we know them less well. We've replaced intimacy with familiarity. It's interesting to note that 10 years ago, one in 10 Americans said they had nobody whatsoever to confide in. 10 years on, this figure has jumped to one in four. There are 300,000 applications for an Apple iPhone. Apparently, there's not a single one for loneliness. I'm sure I will be accused of exaggerating this point, but it seems to me that empathy and tolerance of others could be two of the casualties of our instant digital culture. If we're constantly looking down in iPod oblivion, as it were, we are less aware of others, and some of these people might need our help from time to time. Equally, if we personalize our experience of reality via RSS feeds, Google Alerts, friendship requests, and so on, it's less likely that we will be confronted with people or ideas that disagree with us. Our, our thinking won't be as challenged quite as much. Part three of the book. Now, the internet is a wonderful invention, and there's plenty of people talking about how wonderful it is, so I'm not, I'm not really going to go there. Um, I wouldn't be able to do much of what I do today without the internet. I mean, I run an internet-based business, for heaven's sake. And I'm not declaring war on digital devices. Many of them are unbelievably useful. I'm not saying that Google is evil. I'm not saying that Apple is rotten. They're not. I'm just essentially, I think, arguing for some level of analog digital balance, much in the same way that people talk about work-life balance. I'm saying that we should think further ahead, and I think I'm saying that we should question some of our assumptions a bit more often. Also, I think fundamentally that technology should be used in combination with human intelligence and judgment, not as a replacement, and that we use technology to enhance human relationships, not to negate them. Okay, so what can we do? Can I get the next slide, please? This is um, a delicatessen in Sydney, and it was quite unusual when I first saw it, so I took a photograph. I'm now beginning to see this sort of sign crop up quite a bit. Um, I think the first thing we need to do is, is to think. We need to think about the relative merits of different analog and digital technologies and pick the very best tools for the job. For example, evidence is emerging quite strongly now that pixels and paper are actually quite different. When we use screens, our minds are generally set on sort of seek and acquire. It's, it's a very fast mindset, which is fine if you want to accumulate or distribute facts very, very quickly. But with paper, I think it's a little bit different. Our minds are more relaxed. We tend to see context. Our thinking is a little bit more curious and questioning. Um, for example, I mean, there's evidence that, that people are more reckless with their money when it's digital. There was something about this in the papers only yesterday. It's as though it, as it's, when it's digitalized money, it's as though it belongs to someone else, and we spend it rather impulsively. And I think it's the same in my experience, certainly, with digital statements and bills. You know, I get a digital statement or a bill, I scan it very quickly with my eyes, and then I completely forget about it or delete it. Paper bills, paper statements, seem to have more weight in contrast. We take them more seriously. We're on the lookout for things that don't add up. So, what can we do about this if we're trying to get the, sort of the balance between the analog and the digital uh, better aligned? Can I get the next slide? I think one of the first things we should do is restrict the flow of information a little bit. In the US, people consumed 300% more information in 2008 than they did in 1960. So one could argue that it's now at attention, not information, where the power is, resides these days. We should learn how to control the flow of information. We should learn that not all information is useful or trustworthy. And we should remember that despite the digital revolution, the medium still influences the message. 
And I'll give you an example of this. I was about halfway through the book, and it occurred to me that I needed some more information about where and when people did their best thinking. Now, what is best thinking? I'm talking about deepest, certainly most valuable to someone, which is subjective, I know, but I think most people sort of understood what the question meant. Now, I decided that I needed about 1,000 responses to, to get a sort of good view on this, but then it sort of suddenly dawned on me. If I wanted 1,000 responses, in my experience, you'd need to mail somewhere between 50,000 and 100,000 people. You know, sort of bugger. Um, then I had a bit of an idea, in the bath, as it happens. If people are busy and don't know me, asking them to stop and think for a few minutes is quite a lot to ask. They're probably not going to do it. But then I had a thought. What if the interruption was itself unusual? What if, as well as sending out emails and trying to phone people, I sent out typed and handwritten letters? It worked. I got close to 1,000 responses. I got replies from Howard Gardner, Susan Greenfield, James Dyson, Nick Mason from Pink Floyd. I mean, I even got an indirect response from the Prince of Wales, which I wasn't expecting. Now, what does this prove? I think, fundamentally, it proves that scarcity still creates value. I think it also proves, to some extent, that if the, something's really, really easy, you sh probably shouldn't do it. You should resist it. I mean, there's a great line from Jack White from the band The White Stripes in a documentary I saw recently, and he said something along the lines of, convenience is the disease that you have to fight in any creative field, which I think is an interesting quote. The second thing you can do from time to time is disconnect a bit. Our brains need to relax. I mean, if they don't, they simply don't function properly. If you don't have enough rest, memories are not properly stabilized. Furthermore, if you don't have enough sleep, you know, new brain cells don't get produced. It can lead to depression, anger, hostility, and all of these kind of things. So I think we should switch our mobiles off after 6.30 every night. I mean, it's interesting to me that we try to set boundaries, or parents try to set boundaries around screen use for their kids yet we don't seem to restrict our own usage. So please, you know, resist the urge to take your BlackBerry on holiday. Don't ask, answer texts in the middle of restaurant meals, and don't send emails when you're spending time with your kids. I think this is really important, especially if you have small kids. Much of the concern surrounding the use of mobiles, Facebook, Twitter, etc., seems to have focused on, on kids, particularly teens. But adults are a very major part of the story. There's a book coming out next year, I believe, by Sherry Turkle at MIT around parental use of digital technology, and her argument is that it's making kids feel quite isolated and quite hurt, and I've seen this myself. I mean, last year in Sydney, I went to a Father's Day assembly at school. There were about 100 kids aged 5 to 8, and I don't know, maybe about 50 dads, and half of the dads, I'd estimate, spent the entire time on their Blackberries. I mean, they're connect they were connected all right, but they weren't connected to their kids. I've see seen it around swimming pools on summer holidays. I've certainly seen it in restaurants and so on and so forth. I've seen mums doing similar things. I mean, when I grew up, which was a very long time ago, prams used to face inwards towards the parent. Mobiles didn't exist. There was almost no choice but to engage with your child. The next time you see a mother or a father pushing a pram, first of all, look at which way the pram is facing, and secondly, what, what, watch what the parent is doing, and then consider what this lack of engagement could be doing to the child's development. Can I get another slide, please? I ripped this out of a magazine 10 years ago. I knew I'd have use for this eventually. I think, most of all, we have to create the time and space to think. It's not going to happen by itself. I mean, when, for instance, was the last time you heard somebody say to you, I'm just popping off now to do a bit of thinking? It just doesn't happen. Go for a walk, ideally by yourself. Build something with your hands. You need to do something that's superficially mundane, because you need to allow your mind to wander a bit. Allow yourself to become bored once in a while, because I think boredom is a catalyst for creation. This doesn't happen to kids anymore. They're scheduled. They're always having to do something. It's very prescribed. One of the key things I'm very fond of, instead of having a solitary sandwich at your desk, which I'm sure is terribly efficient, go out to lunch with some of your colleagues. I mean, you could even invite Dionysus along once in a while, if you like. Third, Go to places where ideas can find you. Now, I mentioned in the research, I asked people where and when they did their best thinking, and, and all of the results, well, most of the results, are either in the book or, or on my blog. Now, what do people say? This is the top ten in order. The first one, when I'm alone. Second, last thing at night or in bed. That was very, very popular with people. In the shower, as you'd expect. First thing in the morning. In the car, didn't expect that one. Reading a book, newspaper, or magazine. In the bath, expected that. Outside anywhere, and running or jogging. 
Now, interestingly, not a single person mentioned digital technology. Nobody said on the phone. Nobody said on the computer, on Twitter or Google. Technology, it seems, is incredibly good for spreading ideas around, for developing ideas, but it seems to be fairly useless for hatching them in the first place. What was also incredibly interesting about this research, which I still haven't quite recovered from, is that out of all of those people, one said in the office. And they didn't actually mean the office, because they said really early in the morning when nobody's there. <laughs> and you know, you just think of the money we spend trying to get this to happen in offices, and it seems to be an unbelievable waste of time and money. You know, why don't people have good ideas at work? The, ma the main reason is incredibly simple, because they're too busy and they're trying to have ideas. You need to stop thinking to get an idea. You have to slightly lose your mind, and the best way to do that is to not be at work. Now, did any of the answers I received from people about their thinking spaces have anything in common? I think they did. Scale seems to be extremely important. You have to feel small. Now, I think that's probably why so many people mention things like beaches, mountains, churches. It's in these situations that our minds seem to, to expand to fill the available space, if you like. Seeing a distant horizon also seems to work because I think it somehow projects our thinking forward into the future. Movement, planes, trains, and automobiles, but also water seems to be very good. Anything where movement is actually slightly, our movement is slightly restricted or, or things are slightly beyond our control seems to be very good. Long haul plane trips, particularly if you can get a window seat, seem to work extremely well. I would imagine prisons are quite good thinking spaces too. Now, I've run out of time, so I'm going to leave you with one final thought. Technology is not destiny. The human brain is, as far as we know, the most complex structure in the universe, but it has one incredibly simple fix feature. It's not fixed. It's malleable. It's plastic. It is impressionable to the point where it records every single thing that happens to it. And I mean every single thing, even if you don't realize it. Now, you might think that text messages, internet searches, sat-navs, Google don't affect you. You'd be wrong. They already have. The question, therefore, I think, is not whether they will influence your thinking or change your brain, but how. The real question, though, I think, is whether or not we have the time to change things if we want some things to stay the same. Now, I said at the beginning I was curious about why you were all here. You know, why has this sold out? Now, you might answer that you're not on Facebook or Twitter either. But I don't, I don't think that's it. I think you might share a few of my concerns. I think you might be concerned that the global is starting to destabilize the local. I think you might be concerned that the virtual is starting to weaken the physical. And I think you might be concerned that the cold logic of computers is taking the warmth out of human relationships, that digital culture is not a wholly positive development. Most of all, though, I think you are here because everyone else is here which is much the same as saying that despite the dexterity of our digital devices, machines are currently incapable of providing three things that people value very highly indeed, namely curiosity, questions, and physical connection. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you for that, Richard. I think this is an, a very important book, and... Um, one thing that it convinced me of was that the turn-off movement is coming, just like the slow food movement, which you talk about quite a lot in the book. Um, so, uh, so thank you for that. Just two or three questions before we, we open up to, to, to our, our splendid audience. The, the first is on this issue of, of information. Now, the way our brains operate is that the bits of our brains that contain facts are not, as it were, turned on all the time. We kind of reach into that bit of the brain when we need to know something. How conceptually di different is it that I have a bit of my brain in which I keep facts, which I turn to when I need some information, or that I have an electronic machine in my pocket which has that information that I can turn to when I need it? Does it really matter? if I no longer keep some of that information in my brain because I know I've got it in my... Does it matter, for example, if I... I mean, I, when I was a kid, I think I remembered a lot of phone numbers. I don't even know my own now. In fact, in my mobile, it says me, and uh, I go and check it. Uh, not just for the sake of it. Um, <laughs> when somebody wants the number, it's not a kind of ego thing. Um, does it matter? Does I, think, it... I think it does matter for one very simple reason, which is when it's in your head, your brain starts making connections. 
Machines don't do that. That's, well, that's the fundamental difference. So if, if you are thinking creatively, if you're trying to develop ideas, you need this connectivity. This is back to the point, to some extent, about the ideas being very sort of social. I mean, I, I talk about in the book about the, the need for ideas to jump into bed and have sex with each other. You know, most ideas are derivative as well. They're, they're linked to other things, and it's the linkages and the connections that I think is is a, is, is a very fertile region indeed. And if the facts, if you like, are simply in a machine, those those connections are not made. Also, the connections, even if they were made, would be quite superficial. Um, I mean, we, we may see, a, I talk in the book about a, a painting of a winter landscape, and that will resonate with you because it will connect to things you've experienced in the past. Machines can't experience reality at the moment. I mean, they could tell you it's cold. They could tell you who painted the picture and when, but they can't relate it to feelings of sort of hope, joy, fear, love. There's a, there's a sort of fundamental difference there, but I, th I think it is that connectivity thing. And this is also quite interesting in terms of you know, how the brain operates and why sleep's so important. Um, why you need to mull things over, why you let, need to let it sort of just hang out in your head for a little while. So I think there is a difference. I'd love to pursue that further, but we'll, we'll wait for it to, 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 to open up. Um, turning from information uh, um, to, to think about another angle of, um, of your argument, which is to do with the difference between paper and screen. Is there an argument that's simply a kind of transitional issue? That uh, as, for example, your book, I, I understand, is going to be published as an e-book. Mm. Uh, so uh, as we read books, as if people read Dostoevsky on their screen, won't it start to change the way in which they think about the information they're getting on screen? Isn't it simply that because we associate screens with a particular type of kind of line-by-line -line data and emails, that's what... That's what we're looking for, but over time that will change. I think to answer that, first of all, we just don't know. The, the technology is too new. The internet's barely 5,000 days old. Our knowledge of, of the brain is expanding all the time, but it's still relatively narrow. So we just don't know. We'll, to some extent, just have to wait and find out. Um, I think there are differences. I think it depends on what, you, what, what the, the, I hate this word content, but it depends on what the content is. It depends on what the screen is. I am less concerned about, and we had a big debate about whether it should be an e-book or not, but um, I have less of a problem with a Kindle because you're not having email pinging. You're not, it, you know, you're, you're not offered hyperlinks. I think if you were trying to read it on a computer where email is coming up or you have the chance to actually click on something and go somewhere else, I think that's a massive problem. Um, I think, what else would I say about that? Um, it, de it depends on the type of content. I mean, I don't have a problem with, and I do, I, you know, I read newspapers online, um, if I'm trying to acquire facts. Um, and I think what might happen, for example, with newspapers is, is if you go really into the future, sort of 20, 30, 40 years into the future, I think most newspapers, Monday to Friday, will be digitalized and will read them on mobile devices. And it will be the acquisition of facts. It will be about just news. But I think at weekends, they'll probably stay largely on paper because we have a different mindset at weekends and you'll be able to do deep analysis. I don't think you can do deep analysis on a smartphone. I think you need either an incredibly big screen with, with very few distractions, or ideally, paper. And then finally, before I open it up to kind of stand right back from this, do you think, because the book, one of the themes of your book is that you think that, as I implied earlier, that there will be a backlash, that we will see movements to have places where people turn machines off to recognize the importance of thinking and of um, single tasking. How, how confident are you about that? Because there is a view, a kind of apocalyptic view, uh, which is that two things are starting to happen to the human race. One is that we've peaked in, a new, in evolutionary terms. So that because, as it were, we can all survive now because of machines and because of the kind of sophistication of modern life, we no longer have an evolutionary process whereby it's the kind of fittest and strongest and cleverest to survive. We all kind of survive. So the kind of sorting process is not happening. And also because of all this stuff, we don't really need to do any thinking. We don't need to. So we, our cognitive abilities and our evolutionary kind of stage, may, we may have peaked. We may start to, to, to slide back. At the same time, our machine's getting more and more sophisticated. So the gap then, which exists between human capacity and machine capacity, gets greater and greater, and sooner or later this will lead to some kind of social, environmental, or just mere accidental collapse. 
So do you think that we are going to get round the other side of this and reinsert human values, or do you think actually we could be on a kind of headlong rush to, to, to some kind of much worse outcome? I don't know. Um, well, you're a futurist. I mean, for goodness sake. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I don't believe in one future. I believe in multiple futures. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, if I forced you to bet, though. Um, <laughs> well, there's a quote I use in the book, um, and I can't remember who said it, that there's only three forces at play. There, is, there, is, there are humans, nature, and technology. But unfortunately, it looks like nature might be on the side of technology. So that's, that's a bit of a worry. Um, I think, though, we are really quite smart. And our timing is quite often a bit off. But you know, we, we start to see when things have swung too far. This, this whole sort of slow media unplugging thing is starting to happen already. Now, I don't really expect that to get as strong as digitalization, virtualization, and so on. But it is happening. I mean, unfriending was a big word last year. And you know, I've, there's people talking about slow bogging now, which I can't quite get my head around. But, um, and you, know, you look at the sale of, of writing paper and pens, and it's going through the roof. It's quite bizarre. But, but that's, to some extent, just a sort of straightforward counter trend. Um, I think what will probably happen is that, that we will have a choice. I think it's unlikely that all books would become e-books. I think we'd be quite unhappy about that, and I think people would argue about that. So you, you can sort of pick the future you like and live in it to some extent, and I think that is happening already. Um, you know, as to whether you can change human nature or not, you'd have to ask a, a sort of scientist, but my, my gut feeling is I don't think it's as fixed as people think it is. I think it could change. Um, and then you get into wonderful debates about singularities and artificial intelligence and all the rest of it. So. Um, Let's just say I'm, I'm concerned about it and would like people to think about it more often.